Uh, so can if you have any questions, uh, use the microphones, uh, because otherwise you will not be able to hear you. Uh, can, can you use the microphone, please? I have a question for Mr. Arnott, uh, and I would like to thank for the opportunity to, uh, uh, to ask this question. Uh, I understand uh, that um, fundamental is indexing for obvious reasons is associated with higher turnover, and you did address uh, this issue in one of your papers, uh, saying that most of the turnover happens in more liquid stocks, and therefore the impact, uh, the rebalancing cost is not uh, that significantly higher. I was wondering, for a taxable investor, if you've done a similar analysis and uh, investigated the tax impact of rebalancing. Thank you. Yeah, a uh, couple of observations on that. Uh, firstly, the, the turnover goes from extraordinarily low to very low. Uh, the indexers are often uh, dismissive based on the notion that uh, the turnover has, is twice that of cap weighting. Well, that means going from 6% turnover to 12% turnover. 12% turnover is very, very low by anyone's standards. Now, the turnover does have the character of trimming back on winners and buying into companies that have tanked, underperformed relative to their fundamental scale. So that does introduce a little bit of a tax burden, but a 10% turnover is slight. Now, it's very important to note that when you're dealing with a mutual fund or an exchange-traded fund, your assets are commingled with others. That means that new money flowing into the mutual fund or the ETF is going to wind up being useful for rebalancing purposes so that if it is very carefully run, there's no reason that any turnover would be needed in the form of selling stock A to buy stock B. This in turn means that uh, it should be possible to produce very little, if any, capital gains distributions when running a commingled capacity. For a separate account, it will produce a little bit of turnover, and that little bit of turnover will, will trigger a little bit of tax burden. But way less, way less than most active managers. I'm going to ask a little tangential question, but uh, since you put it into your presentation, uh, you have mentioned all the theories that don't work. Where does that leave you in terms of uh, us academics? How should we deal with these <laughs> theories? You know, um, I have a world of respect for academia. When I make these comments, it's not out of disrespect at all, and I, I, I want to make that very clear. Uh, in the world of physics, when the data contradicts the theory, there tends to be a certain amount of jubilation of, uh, gosh, this is wonderful, now it gives us a chance to tighten our theories and improve them. In the world of finance, when the data contradicts the theory, there tends to be uh, more of a dismissive view because the, the, the signal to noise and share price behavior is very, very low. And so it's all too easy to say the theory is elegant, therefore the data must be wrong. Another way to look at it would instead be to say, let's use the data to learn from it, and let's find ways to refine and improve our theories. I think theory in the finance world is immensely important. I think we make a mistake when we confuse theory for factual reality. I think theory represents a good approximation of the real world, and as the theories improve, the approximation gets better and better. I think the role of the finance community ought to be one of open-minded acceptance that theory is not fact, and open-minded acceptance that data that contradicts theory can be used to help improve the theory. And I think that's not missing in academia by any means but is uh, not the prevailing mindset. So it, I, I guess it would be my goal to see the academic world be a little more respectful of data and a little bit more willing to uh, uh, examine one's own core beliefs and core assumptions. Uh, if, 
you'll forgive a digression when I served as a visiting professor at UCLA. I remember a professor from Harvard, an assistant professor from Harvard, came in to present a paper. Uh, basically, in academia, that's a form of job interview. You're, you're brought in, you present some of your research, and you defend it against vigorous attack from what might be your new colleagues. Well, what was interesting in her presentation is she opened by saying, uh, what I'd like to do is to explore the character of companies that might be expected to perform well or badly if there are modest inefficiencies in the market. There was a chorus of comments from at least four professors saying, but the market is efficient. So you could tell that their ears were closed, their minds were closed for the rest of her presentation. She did not get offered a job. She went to Berkeley instead. More power to her. But uh, the notion of being willing to entertain the idea that one's core beliefs may not be precisely correct, I think is the hallmark of the best academics. Uh, Harry Markowitz thinks this is uh, this whole idea of the fundamental index. Uh, challenges some of the core precepts of modern finance and thinks it's just fascinating and marvelous fun. So does Jack Trainer. There are other academics who say this is hogwash, the market is efficient. Uh, Howard, uh, how does traditional ETFs, I guess, respond to all uh, You showed us some charts that uh, actually was the first of what uh, Robert was showing that uh, the cap wave did outperform uh, the RAFI. So, why? Yeah, well, I, again, I think it's time period sensitive, as we all know. Uh, what's the length of time, when's the start date, and, and when is the end date? Uh, it, it's going to definitely have an influence on, on what sort of conclusions you come to. Uh, I would say that uh, if it's not really an ETF argument, I would say the market cap weighting group uh, would argue that uh, that is a, a, the natural way to index and that. Uh, Fundamental indexing it is really a, an active tilt or a beta tilt, if you will, uh, towards value uh, and, and less towards size, which is fine if that's what you want. I don't think the market cap crowd is saying that it, 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 it may work or may not work. They're just saying it, it is different and just know what you own it when you go that route, that's all. Robert, are you a passive index or an active index? That depends how you define your terms. When I first wrote my article, I, I circulated it to an array of academics, uh, folks like Markowitz and Sharp and Siegel and others, seeking their academic comments. Um, when I next saw Bill Sharp, I said, I didn't hear back from you, what do you think? And his, his reaction was, I think this is a very cool, very interesting active strategy. So he was dismissive because in his view, anything that's not cap-weighted is active. And that's because the capital asset pricing model says that the market clearing portfolio is mean variance efficient. Well, if it's mean variance efficient, you shouldn't be able to produce higher returns at lower risk. But it's mean variance efficient only if the markets themselves are efficient. So uh, depending how we define our terms, if you define your terms as Anything that departs from cap weighting is active, then this is active. That's fine. If you define your terms as uh, passive investing means replicable, formulaic, uh, objective, uh, transparent, relatively low turnover, then this qualifies on all counts. Ironically, the S&P 500 doesn't qualify on four of the five criteria, only the low turnover. Um, and so, depending on whether you use a theoretically pure definition of active versus passive or a pragmatic, uh, practitioner-oriented definition, you could call this active, you could call it passive. Uh, I view that as a semantics issue and an issue of definition of terms. And folks, why I call it an active strategy, doesn't bother me. Uh, uh, one follow-up question. Uh, you know, which is directly on your results. These types of results uh, sometimes uh, uh, cannot be reproduced or they don't have internal consistency in the sense that if everybody tries to apply it, then you erode the effect. They're more like an anomaly. 
Uh, could you comment on that issue? If everybody followed this advice, then the anomaly tends to get erased. Is that a fair comment or not? That's a fair comment. The, there, you raised two issues. One is the robustness. Uh, this idea is robust. It was tested first using sales going back 30 years. Results were brilliant. We then tested it on sales, profits, book value, dividends, number of employees, total assets, uh, uh, aggregate indebtedness, and an array of other factors, and they all worked. They all added two, two and a half percent per annum. The one outlier was gap weighting. So that looked darn robust. We tested it in, uh, the more I tested it in the 23 developed world markets, we've since gone on to test it in over 40 markets. And the more has resulted added value in every single market in our work at added value in over 90% of the markets. And the ones where it does, there are markets where there's one or two dominant assets, and so it, it, it uh, uh, would be dwarfed by the noise of the one or two assets. Uh, the idea has been tested in the 10 global sectors. It has value 10 out of 10. The idea has been tested in small companies domestically and internationally separately. It has value in both. The idea has been tested in emerging markets that have immense value there. So is it robust? Yes. Historically, it's very robust. Net of the average value tilt it's enormously robust. In the U.S., three-fourths of the value added is over and above what we can explain from the average value tilt. Um, now, does that mean it's immune to arbitrage? Of course not. One thing that's wonderful about a fundamental index is that it is immensely scalable. We've penciled it out at a trillion-dollar hypothetical scale in the U.S., well, that would be 5% of the total market cap. How many companies would we own 20% of the available float? About 20 names out of the top thousand. That's all. And most of those are at the bottom of the list. So at a trillion dollar scale, we will probably have to start making some concessions to float adjustments. At the current scale of 10 billion or so, uh, it's a non-issue. And our trading is so, so small that our impact on prices has got to be de minimis. But your point is absolutely fair that as money flows into the idea, if it's large, if it's a quarter trillion, a half trillion, it's going to eventually start to move prices. And as it moves prices, it'll pull in the tails of the distribution. The companies with the highest multiples will be trimmed because they're above their economic scale to buy companies at lowest multiples because they're trading below their economic scale. And so as the idea is embraced, the tail of the distribution will come in, and the forward-looking effectiveness of the idea will be diminished. Now, the beauty in that is that the transition from here to there is one that would impose a performance drag on cap weighting and apply a performance boost to the fundamental index, which means the early adopters might actually see outside gains directly attributable to the steady embrace of the idea of years ahead. So I see that as a two-edged sword. I think that the question you ask is one that we should come back to in about 10 years and ask uh, 10 years hence, is there enough in this to have materially eroded its potential efficacy? Okay. Last question there? Uh, yeah. I have a question to Mr. Arnott. Uh, going a little bit, a little bit back to the theories, uh, I found through uh, Mr. Jason Sue's beautiful map, and um, thank you. <laughs> and uh, it was my pleasure. And uh, it, uh, the central uh, argument, uh, the model is based uh, on the assumption that there is a fixed uh, true value, and uh, there is a random noise uh, around it. Uh, right. I also had. Um, uh, privilege of uh, seeing Mr. Uh, Brawl's paper, and he essentially shows that uh, his uh, argument is we cannot observe uh, true value. What we do know is current market price, and if we model it in a slightly different way, if we model uh, current market price and we try to derive the fair value distribution from the market price using an error term, then one can actually show that uh, cap weighting uh, is market efficient and does not have performance attract. So I would be very interested to, to hear Mr. Arnold's comment on sure. that. Thank you. Well, first, 
Actually, both theses are absolutely correct. One is an inefficient market thesis, the other is an efficient market thesis. In the case of Parole's work, there's an efficient market thesis that uh, price is known, that fair value is symmetrically distributed uh, around uh, price, and that the errors are uncorrelated to price. The work that Jason and I have done makes the supposition that price is not known, excuse me, that fair value is not known, but that price is the market's best guess at fair value, and therefore is likely to be symmetric around fair value, with the errors uncorrelated to fair value. It's a very subtle but very important distinction. In Parole's case, the error is uncorrelated to price. In our case, it's uncorrelated to the unknowable fair value. Now, uh, in effect, what Parole has done is to alter our assumptions, to presume that we were assuming an efficient markets distribution, and to demonstrate that there's no performance drag for cap weighting. Uh, if the market's efficient. We don't dispute that. So he built a straw man and knocked it down. Uh, uh, in a sense, he put words in my mouth and then proved those words to be false. Well, that's fine, but those weren't my words. Those weren't our assumptions. So uh, uh, I don't view his paper, uh, and this is a, a bit unusual for me to say this about Andre, I don't view his paper as a serious critique. Uh, uh, Parole has done some brilliant work over the years. He's an outstanding mathematician. He's a far better mathematician than I am. But in this particular case, he put words in our mouths and uh, proved them wrong. Well, that's, that's, that's not uh, quite the right way to do things. So there are some interesting criticisms of the fundamental index, both in theory and in practice. Uh, we are uh, very comfortable that the empirical evidence is enormously robust. We are very comfortable that the theory is a closer match to the real world than the efficient markets hypothesis, but we're open to the fact that people could dispute that with great vigor. Uh, we also have a paper, that, a draft paper that we're working on with uh, uh, Jun Liu and Harry Markowitz exploring the mathematics of this idea. And if anyone would like to see an advanced copy of that, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, email address is rnot.ralc.com. Uh, I'd be happy to share a, an advanced copy of that paper with you and explore some of the nuances of that with you. Uh, this has been an exciting project. It's one of the few, it's the only one I've ever been involved in that both uh, has powerful practical implications and some potentially important implications with regard to the underpinnings of modern finance, uh, calling into question some of those core theories. Uh, in that context, it's uh, been enormously satisfying and enormously exciting to work on this. Thank you all very much for your time. Uh, maybe just, uh, I want to ask a quick question and then I want to ask uh, Solomon how to make some final uh, comment. Uh, right. Uh, how about in his comments mentioned that um, you know style goes in and out of favor, and he said that in the in the six after in the, after the sixties, uh, value beat growth, but uh, uh, he seemed to indicate that before the sixties, uh, growth beat um, value by wide margin. Now, what's going to happen to Rafi if if growth starts to outperform value? Um, well, firstly, the fundamental index doesn't make money based on growth or value. That's a widespread misconception. It makes money based on breaking the link between over and under valuation and the weight in the portfolio. Now what that means is that uh, because cap weighting has a growth tilt and we don't, we have a powerful value tilt relative to cap weighting. So when we have a market that uh, in which growth is ascendant, Cap weighting has a tailwind. We know it's temporary, but it can be fairly powerful. Uh, fundamental indexing doesn't enjoy that tailwind, so 
the natural alpha of the fundamental index, which comes from breaking the length between over and under valuation and portfolio weight, is eroded by the growth dominated market. Our value added will be diminished, and if it's a strong enough growth market, it will be eliminated and reversed. We'll underperform. In a value market, cap weighting will struggle. Cap weighting uh, has a growth tilt and will be pulled down by a value dominated market. So, in a value market, we operate with a temporary artificial tailwind. And in that circumstance, the fundamental index will always win, often by a very large margin. So it's not quite as simple as growth winning and value winning. Now, what happens if growth wins in the next three years? Uh, we've had value winning for seven, so it could very easily happen. Um, remember the dynamic nature of the value tilt. The value tilt is one and a half times that of the, of the Russell value index at the peak of the bubble, just before value soared and rewarded handsomely anyone who was valued and provided immense rewards for those who were deep valued. The fundamental index today has one third as much value itself as the value index. So if growth beats value by a thousand basis points, that's going to hurt us. Um, um, that means that that value will underperform the broad market by 5%, will underperform by half that. So if growth beats value by 1,000 basis points, will underperform the market by 1.7%. Plus, we'll get our structural alpha from not overweighting the overvalue and underweighting the undervalue. So even with a 10% differential growth versus value, we might eke out a positive value added. Uh, year to date, growth has beat value in the U.S., and here to date, the fundamental index has added 128 basis points. Uh, that's interesting. So it's, it's more robust than most people think, and it's not as simple a value versus growth story as some people think. Okay, thank you very much, Al. Uh, Howard, any uh, last point you want to make? Yeah, I just say thank you very much for having us here today. Uh, I think that market cap weighting has, has stood the test of time. And it's actually been done with money actually invested in that strategy. And I guess I, I have a little bit of trouble with the idea that uh, the theories that support market cap weighting are, are invalid, and but the theories that support fundamental indexing are valid. I mean, we haven't seen money invested in, in fundamental indexing. It is all the theory at that, this point going back a long time. It's only been invested in, in actual dollars invested in the strategy for a relatively short period of time compared to the, the time periods that we're looking at. And, and the fact that active strategies do get uh, arved away as, as more money uh, chases them, uh, at some point or another, uh, that has to happen. And I think that you can affect a, a tilt in your portfolio towards whatever strategy you want and still employ the cost efficiencies of market cap weight. I'm grateful to have heard the views of somebody who will take the other side of our trade. Thank you. I think the final comment I would make, and thank you again for having us here, um, is that fundamental indexing is an approach that is a broad market approach. It's not a value approach. It's not, uh, it's not a growth approach. We do have value pro, um, you know, cycles in the market. We have growth cycles in the market, as, as Howard was so clean, uh, uh, good to point out. The value, though, of this index is a broad market benchmark. When you're looking at the broad market benchmarks, it's the Russell 1000, the 2000, the global MSCI EV, and uh, other markets as well. This is a benchmark that looks to outperform that through taking advantage of some of the issues with market cap indexing. Simple as that. I think everyone in the room here is not a market efficiency uh, theorist. I think everyone here believes that there is value add from stock picking or value add from active overlays. And this is just a way to look at the uh, better benchmark and better beta. And from an active overlay strategy, if we look at what money has been invested, this is gaining significant potential, oh, sorry, significant investment in the marketplace and has track records of real dollars invested. And Rob himself has been managing this uh, for institutions for over three, for almost three years now with the okay. same results. Well, uh, very happy, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you guys ago, it was easy to discuss uh, management styles for common stocks. Uh, one was a passive manager or an active manager. Uh, the passive manager held the index. The active manager did something else. Things have gotten a bit more complicated as discussed today and so on. 
the line between passive and active management has become increasingly fuzzy. You have many different views and philosophies. However, despite the diverse range of investment philosophies and convictions you heard, there seems to be a consensus resulting from today's presentations, which is for investors to do their homework, take a long-term view, and discipline approach to the capital markets. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope the session gave you some insight into the various investment philosophies and which are best for your personal style and development. Uh, before I finish, I'd like to thank uh, our speakers, uh, Rob, uh, John, Sam, uh, Howard, and myself. Um, I'd like to thank Wendy uh, Wyrod and Carly Baden-Hayman uh, from our um, uh, University, uh, as well as uh, Dean Carol Stevenson and uh, Glenn Yonamichu for the continued support of my center and its activities. Many thanks to Mr. Richard Rooney and uh, Berkham Asset Management uh, for the support over the years and for today for, for sponsoring the, uh, the lunch. And to Mr. Prem Watson and Fergus Financial Holdings, for without them, the Ben Graham Chair and the Ben Graham Center, Graham Center for Value Investing would not be a possibility. And uh, for the continued support I have received in the center from them. Thank you very much, all.